Okay, any questions before we continue? Well, it will be a very short discussion on elasticity. Now, we had, if you remember, uh, we had discussed Hooke's law. And in that case, we had the spring. At the end of the spring, we attached the mass that was an equilibrium point of the spring. And if we extended it further, by let's say, this is the equilibrium point, if this is x, for the spring case, we say that the force exerted by the spring was minus k times x. It's in the opposite direction of the displacement, and it is proportional to the displacement where k is the spring constant. And in fact, this is just a simple model of more or less everything you see around you. Like if you look at the solids, we also had a discussion on the solids. If you have solids, the solids are nothing but just a bunch of atoms or molecules. Most of them would be arranged in a kind of a lattice. This is our lattice. Etc. So you also have some uh, atoms inside. And we said that when we were discussing especially the potential energy, any potential that you have, whatever it is, close to this stable equilibrium points, it will always behave like a spring. So we can imagine that all these atoms, this is just a simple model of solids, all these atoms are connected to each other by springs. This is just a simple model of solids. They are all connected with each other. So if they are connected by springs, I mean solids, they are not really rigid in the sense that if you remember our definitions of the rigid body, we said that a rigid object is an object whose shape doesn't change at all. By the way, in the midterm, for example, the, the rod, we said that it was rigid. Rod and the mass system as a whole is not a rigid object because the, sh the shape of rod plus the point mass is constantly changing. The mass is moving relative to the rod. The whole system is not a rigid body, but the whole system is made up of two rigid bodies. Anyway, let's come back to this example. <coughs> now let's say if we push it downward, this object, you say that this is a solid, you can imagine, you can model this solid as a collection of atoms connected by springs now, if you push it by a force, you will be compressing the springs, so its shape, its length will change a bit. So you have this initially solid object, the solid object with its initial length, L, there is no force acting on it. When we exert a force on it, it will get shorter. Now the change in its length will be delta x. So let's say we exert a force on it. It is a cross-sectional area. This is A. And this delta x, okay, this delta x turns out to be one thing proportional to f, the larger that you exert a force the larger the change in the, its length will be, it will be proportional to the length. The larger the length of it, the larger this length, the larger the uh, delta x will be, inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. Now, 
the A. You can imagine this inverse proportionality as just imagine you take two of these objects, you put them together, and you exert the same force, exactly the same force. Half of this force will be exerted on one of the objects, half of it will be exerted to the other one. So since the force acting on each one of these will be half, delta x will be half. If you double the area, it's just like putting two of them together. Since the force will be distributed over the, all of the area, so delta x will be smaller. And there's also the proportionality constant, which is usually called 1 over y. y is called the Young's modulus. So basically, if you look at this object, one of the important things for us would be delta x, or the force that you exert, is proportional to delta x. This will be one of the important things for us. It's just like it satisfies the Hooke's law. Now, this is one way of exerting your force. Of course, you can exert a force horizontally. Let's say you take this object, again, another solid. You just exert a force in the horizontal direction. If you exert a force in the horizontal direction, you see that it is deformed. The top part moves relative to the bottom part. You take your object. Again, a solid object. So you ex this time you exert a force in the horizontal direction. No, oh, sorry. This is the height. This is your delta x. Again, you have this cross-section A. It's just like this book example. You take the book. You just push it to one side. It will be the top part will slide, but the bottom part is fixed. This is what we call shear. It's just a name. So if you hear it, know that it's from this definition. You exert a, this time you exert a horizontal force. Now, the difference from the previous part is that in the previous part you are exerting a longitude of force along the displacement, or you, you exert a force perpendicular to the area. Here you exert a force in the direction of the area. Now, again, this displacement delta x will be proportional to h. It will be pr proportional to the force that you exert. It will be inversely proportional to the area. It just looks more or less like the previous example. The, only def the main difference is that in the previous case, delta x was perpendicular to the area, and hence the force was perpendicular to the area. In this case, the force and the delta x are parallel to the area. And again, delta x over h, let's say 1 over s. This s is the shear modulus. Delta x over h is equal to f over a. Okay. This is the equation we have. Now, this F over A has a general name, the force per unit area. It is the stress. Okay, I will, is this the stress or strain? It should be the stress. This delta X over H is always called the strain. So whenever you are saying something is stressed, this is what you mean. So make sure that you, when you are Paying stress, you mean this one. Again, the main idea, the most important thing for us will be the force is proportional to delta x. Again, it satisfies the Hooke's law, and it will always try to, it's a so-called uh, restoring force. If you take this object, 
you apply a shear to it, of course it will be deformed. When you release the force, it just comes back to its initial original configuration. So in that sense, the forces are restoring. You, you have to exert the force on this object to deform it, and when you release that force, the object is, uh, the object is exerting a force in the opposite direction, so when you release your hand, it will just go back to its uh, initial configuration. Now, if you refresh your mind about this Hooke's law, or the spring, okay, the force, well, depending on, your, on the exact thing that you are studying, it can be some spring, some uh, compression of a long object, or some shear acting on an object. So it will, be, it will be some different spring constant times x, x being the displacement. By the way, in the commercial springs, which force is more important? Is, is it the Young's modulus or the shear? Is the force that causes the spring to come back? Is it shear or is it this one? Is it the young one? Just take, if you have a, this automatic pens or pencils, remove the spring, remove the spring, take it out. <coughs> so you see there is this wire. Does the length of the wire change? The wire, it's not, it's not a solid object. Does the length of the wire change as you compress it or stretch it? The length of the wire doesn't change. So it's not the young modulus that is relevant over there. In fact, it is actually the shear. Because if you imagine what's actually going on, just take a very small segment of that wire, Well, it's mainly this one. You just take a very small segment. It will be basically a, a cylinder. What you are actually doing when you are stretching it is that you are twisting this cylinder. So at this point just rotates like this. The other point rotates in the other way around. So you are just, let's say, this is your cylinder. You are twisting it so that the two ends, they just rotate in opposite directions. And when you are twisting it like this, if you just imagine you are dividing this whole object into very small cylinders, like that, there is one cylinder over here, you are exerting a shear on the segment. Because the displacement of the top part is perpendicular to the area of that part. So the restoring force in an actual spring is actually created by this shear, not the young modulus. Not convinced. Convinced or not convinced? None of you. Okay. Any questions? So the microscopic mechanism over here is actually the shear. Because the top and the bottom of this piece, they are moving in. Initially they are aligned, but if you stretch it, they will no longer be aligned. This point will move somewhere over here, this point might move somewhere over here. Of this very small segment over here. Now we had already calculate the corresponding potential energy for this force. And we know that the potential energy was 1 over 2 kx squared. So potential energy basically had this form. And when we were studying potential energies, let's see, if you, we have an object whose total mechanical energy is equal to this one, so we know that in this, in, on the left-hand side, 
the force is towards this point x0, the force is in this direction, whereas on the right hand side, the force is always in this direction. So that the force will be always in the direction towards the equilibrium point, which was x0. And so if you take an object, a point mass, Let's say that you put that object with an initial velocity at this point and the initial velocity is in this direction. So will it speed up or slow down? It will slow down because the force, of the acceleration is in the opposite direction to its velocity, it will slow down. It will come to this point and when it reaches that point it will just stop there but still there is a force towards x0 so it will start accelerating towards x0. So this is one turning point. It will come back here. This is the point where it has the maximum kinetic energy. And then after crossing this point, at this point the force is zero. There is no force acting on my object. But nevertheless it has a velocity, so it will keep moving towards the right. Since it, is, it keeps moving towards the right, the force now is again in the opposite direction of its velocity, so it will slow down. It will slow down until it comes to this point where it will stop. That is another turning point. It will stop there, but nevertheless there is a force acting on it, so it will just come back. And it will accelerate towards the left. It will keep accelerating, and it will just repeat this motion. So it will just go left, right, left, right, and it will just keep, keep moving. This is what we call a, it will in fact make what we call a periodic motion. It will repeat itself. When it reaches this point again, it will have exactly the same speed in the exactly the same direction. So at this point, exact, at this initial, let's say, so at this point, it will have the exactly same velocity, the same forces will act on it, so it will just repeat itself. Now, it doesn't have to be a, a, such a, a spring potential, a parabolic potential. If you have any potential that has these two turning points, the motion will always be a periodic motion. Now, there is one kind of periodic motion that will be more important for us. It's and that is what we call the harmonic motion. Now, in this case, we didn't study what the solution. We know the force. Since we know the force, we know that mass times the second derivative of the position of the object should be equal to minus k times x. This is Newton's second law but we didn't study the solutions of this one. Now, let's see, let's first study the harmonic motion and then we will show that the harmonic motion is actually a solution of this spring equation. Now, what we call the motion harmonic if x of t is equal to a times cosine omega t plus, let's say, phi. So this is the definition of the harmonic motion. If it's a cosine or in fact a sine, then that motion is called a harmonic motion. And if you remember the shape of a cosine, so let's see, what's the maximum value of this cosine? Now the maximum value of cosine is one. The maximum value of x is a. The minimum value of this cosine function, minus one, so the minimum value of x is minus a. So this, the trajectory of this particle is in fact bounded between these two values. So just like in this previous case, let's say x zero is zero. This is the point a. This is the point minus a, then the motion 
of this object we can describe by such a function, a cosine omega t plus phi. Now, when is the first zero of this one? When is cosine function zero? <coughs> cosine is zero now, when omega t plus phi x of t is equal to zero if omega t plus phi is pi over two plus n pi. Cosine pi over 2 is 0. Cosine 3 pi over 2 is 0. Cosine 5 pi over 2 is 0. They're all zeros. So when for some integer value of n, if omega t plus phi satisfies this value, then the cosine function is 0. So let's say at t equal to 0. No, hold on. So this is t, sorry. So when t is equal to 1 over omega, or let's see, omega t is equal to pi over 2 minus phi plus n pi. Then my cosine function is 0. Now, depending on the value of the phi, they say it can have such a shape. This corresponds to n is equal to 1, n is equal to 0. This is n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, etc. Now, if you change phi, let's say if you increase phi, then definitely the omega t values get smaller and smaller. So basically you are shifting your shape as a whole towards the left. So as you change phi, if you increase phi, this shape will shift toward the left. If you reduce phi, then omega t, the, the points at which, the times at which uh, your displacement is zero, you are at the equilibrium point, they will shift toward the right. Towards the right. So this phi basically determines the sh it shifts your shape. That is why it's called a phase shift. It's just a name. And this A is called the amplitude. So this is our solution. So we said that phi is the phase shift. A is the amplitude. Now let's come to what is this omega. Now we call, the name we give to omega is the angular velocity. Now there is no angle over here. So why do we call it the angular velocity? Just like in the case of rotation. I mean, in the case of rotation, we had the same concept, the angular velocity. This is just one dimensional motion. Our object is moving along a line. We still call it angular velocity. So let's look at an object that is doing uniform circular motion. This is our mass m. m carries out uniform circular motion. Let's call the radius r. Let's call this angle over here. This is our theta. Well, theta will be changing with time. T omega is the angular velocity, angular speed. Now, 
Now, what is theta is a function of time. And let's say that theta at t is equal to 0. t is equal to 0 is equal to 5. What is theta at the time t? It's motion with, uniform, with constant angular speed. Omega times t plus phi. So this is how t changes as a function of time. Now let's choose our coordinate axis. Let's say this is my x-axis. This is my y-axis. What is the y-point of this object? y-coordinate of this object? No, x, sorry. What is the x-coordinate? Somebody else. So I have this object. We already know what this angle is, theta of t. What is the, at this instant, at the time t, what is the x-coordinate of this object? R times cosine theta t, which is omega t plus phi. So this basically tells me that if you have an object that is doing uniform circular motion, the x-coordinate of that object is doing some harmonic motion, some harmonic oscillation. The x-coordinate, it will just move back and forth between x is equal to r and x is equal to minus r. The radius of the circle is nothing but the amplitude of my oscillation. The initial value for my angle theta is nothing but my phase shift it basically determines, it changes depending on which time you choose as your t equal to zero. And this omega is the angular speed, angular frequency, whatever you would like to call it. <coughs> How long does it take to complete one full rotation? Well, one full rotation, theta changes by two pi. So. 2 pi over omega is what we call the angular, no, uh, the period of oscillation. After this much time, the motion just repeats itself. So this is what we call the period of emotion the period of oscillation. If after a given time, the motion just repeats itself, that is what we call the period. Okay, so these, are, these will be the new terms that we will be using to, to describe our motion. Let's see what is the force creating this motion. So we already know how the, this is how we want the position of an object to change in time, but then the question is what is the force that we should exert so that this will be the trajectory. How can we determine the force? Given we know how it moves. Up to this point, we always went the other way around. Once we determined the force, we determined how it, the object moved. But now we know how the object moves. What should be the force that we are exerting on it? Come on. What's Newton's second law? F is equal to m times a. I don't put the vector sign because we are in one dimensional case. What is the acceleration of this object? What is the velocity of this object as a function of time? I know the position. How can I calculate the velocity of an object? Just take the derivative dx by dt, which is minus a omega sine omega t plus phi. What is the acceleration of this object? Now I know the velocity of my object is a function of time. What is the acceleration of this object? Delta v over delta t or dv by dt, which is minus a 
omega squared cosine omega t plus phi which is minus omega squared times x a of t should be equal to minus omega squared times x of t now we know the acceleration just multiply it by the force by the mass no, sorry. that is x we had shown that the acceleration was equal to minus omega squared x of t so the force that should be acting on this object is just mass times acceleration so it is equal to minus m omega squared x of t so we are back to the Hooke's law the force acting on this object should be well omega is just a constant m is just a constant force should be in the direction of the proportional to its displacement so if this is satisfied then my object will be doing some harmonic motion and this all in the Hooke's law this is equal to k times x minus k times x so we can determine what the angular frequency is m omega squared should be equal to k or omega is equal to square root of k over m so if we have a spring we attach a mass to it we know the spring constant we just displace the mass slightly from the equilibrium and release it it will be doing some harmonic motion and this harmon the frequency, the angular frequency of this harmonic motion will be determined by the spring constant and the mass. Now one thing is it will not depend on the amplitude, for example. It doesn't depend on our initial amplitude. Any questions up to this point? For example, this is being at MS That's and MS time, uh, so we are hanging a mass from the wall. So we have this wall, there's a spring. At the end of the spring, th this is the equilibrium length of the spring. We attach a mass to it. It will be stretched a bit. This mass, well, we don't know yet. You see, in the previous case, the only force acting on my object was the spring, uh, spring force. Now here, there is the gravity plus the spring force. Will it be doing harmonic motion or not? We don't know that yet. Let's see. Let's see. This, this is our system. And we want to study the motion of this mass, MS. So this is the equilibrium point of the mass. This is the equilibrium point of spring. This is the equilibrium point of mass when we attach the mass. Let's call this distance D. Let's call this distance L. And let us assume that we pull the mass a bit downward. This is my MS. Let me call this one my X. Let me even give it a direction. This is my X. And let us assume that we just pull it down so that x at the time t is equal to 0 is let's just call it a and we just release it from rest so the velocity at time t equal to 0 is equal to 0 so what will be the next motion of this object
And okay, this length over here, by the way, is L plus D. Now let us write the Newton law. What is the force acting on my mass? Well, there is the weight. The weight is in the plus x direction, so it is just mg. Again, since it's just one dimensional motion, I'm not putting the vector signs. I already chose my positive direction. There is the weight. There is a spring force. What is the spring force? It's in the upward direction, so it's minus. Okay, what is the change in the length of the spring from its equilibrium value? D plus x. This is the total force acting on my spring. Now, what is D? You see, we know that when x is equal to 0, it is at equilibrium over here, so force is equal to 0 when x is equal to 0. So this is force as a function of x. Now, we are already told that f x is equal to 0. If this is equal to 0. But this tells me that, you see, when x is equal to 0, I, I have mg minus kd. Minus kd, this is equal to 0. This is what determines my d. d is equal to mg over k. So the force acting on my object, you see, mg is equal to kd. They just cancel each other. So the force acting on my object is minus kx. And this should be equal to m d squared x by dt squared. This is the Newton's second law. So once I see this equation, you see, before seeing this equation, how the position changes as a function of time, I don't know whether the motion is harmonic or not. It can be periodic, but not all periodic motions are harmonic. Harmonic motion is a special kind of periodic motion. But now I see that the position of my object as a function of time satisfies this equation. So this already tells me that x is a harmonic function. So x is equal to, let's say, uh, some constant cosine omega t plus phi. So if x satisfies this equation, then x should be in this form. Now I use my initial conditions. I know that x at t equal to 0, which is c times cosine phi, this should be equal to a. I also know that dx by dt at t equal to 0, because I'm releasing it from rest at t equal to 0. This is equal to minus c omega sine omega t plus phi at t equal to 0. This is equal to minus c omega sine phi. This is equal to 0. Well, this tells me that sine phi is just 0. C cannot be 0 because if C is equal to 0, that means my object is not moving. We know that it is, we can, I cannot satisfy this equation if C is equal to 0. Omega cannot be 0 because omega is already fixed by the problem. Omega is equal to square root of k over m. So the only choice is that sine of phi is equal to 0. If sine of phi is equal to 0, then, then if you look, cosine phi is 1, c is just a. In fact, sine phi is equal to 0, phi should be 0. So x of t is equal to a cosine omega t. So this a and the phi, they determine my initial conditions. What is your initial velocity? What is your initial position? 
Now we can do even better than this one. Let's say x of t, we know that it's a cosine omega t plus phi in general. This is the general expression for a harmonic motion. I can write this as a cosine phi cosine omega t minus a sine phi sine omega t. Now let's say that x, x0 to be the position of my object at t equal to 0. Now at t equal to 0, x of t is just a cosine phi. Because sine of, one, sine of 0 is just 0. Now the velocity as a function of time, if you just take the derivative, it just becomes minus a cosine phi sine omega t plus a omega, no, here I have an omega, a omega sine of phi cosine omega t. So if we give, call its initial speed v0, again, the sine is 0, so I'm left with this cosine is 1, so I have a omega sine phi. Or from here, I can say that a sine phi is equal to v0 over omega. Now, from these equations, you can determine what a is, what phi is. Or you can just take these expressions for a cosine phi and a sine phi, put it over here, so you know what x of t is. x0 cosine omega t minus v0 over omega sine omega t. This will be the motion as a function of time and as a function of the initial values of the, its position and its speed. Well, you see, omega we call the angular velocity, but the object is moving along a line only. It's not, yes? So I cannot imagine, uh, as I want to say, it must change uh, its angle, it must have an uh, angular displacement. Well, you see, that is the part that will be kind of confusing. There is no angle over here. We are doing one-dimensional motion. If there is just one-dimensional motion, if you cannot take any other point except then along those lines, you cannot define an angle. You cannot talk about the angle. But this terminology is mainly due to this analogy between circular motion and the harmonic motion in one dimension. We said that here, if you take this circular motion, in which case we know how to define the angular velocity, angular frequency, etc., and if we look at the, only the horizontal component of this object, It's independent of that part. OK, so I'm running out of battery. So if you take this object, <coughs> there is this circular motion. And we, say, we have seen that if we just look at the horizontal component of that circular motion, the horizontal component just basically does harmonic motion. From this analogy with the uniform circular motion, we call this omega the angular velocity or the angular frequency. But in one dimension, there is no angles. So no angle is changing. There is no, in the one dimensional, in the one dimensional harmonic motion, there is no angle changing, no angle covered, etc. Angular frequency is just the name in the one-dimensional case. In one dimension, angular velocity describes what? Well, it still describes how often the motion uh, repeats itself. You can still relate it to the period of the motion. So the period of the motion will be still 2 pi over omega because of the properties of the sine and the cosine function. Yes. Other questions?
There's still time for one more quiz. No questions? Okay, see you on Thursday. We will continue with the, the oscillate, one-dimensional oscillations.